In many ways, the F-22 Advanced Tactical Fighter is the true daughter of the F-117. Stealth will be a major factor in the USA, remaining a superpower in the 21st century. We work very hard with the F-22 to integrate stealth into a supersonic, supermaneuverable fighter. And we succeeded. After our last day of YF-22A flight demonstrations from Edwards, late on December 28, 1990, I said to my wife Judea, We won. And we did. Our team delivered results. It was a privilege to lead this team. The F-22 Raptor was the most advanced aircraft of its kind, designed around the principle of first look, first shot, first kill. It's set to become the primary air superiority fighter for the US Air Force in the 21st century. The Raptor, as its name suggests, is a lethal machine. As menacing as it appears, it's even more deadly when deployed for its missions. Deadly and undetectable from long distances. This stunning fifth generation fighter combines unparalleled dogfighting abilities with precise ground attack capabilities. Confidence in these objectives stems from a synergistic blend of features and capabilities, including stealth technology, the ability to cruise at supersonic speeds over long distances without afterburners, and an integrated, highly sophisticated avionics suite. The FA-22A has been designed to be more manoeuvrable, better armed, more reliable, easier to maintain, more readily supportable, and more capable in air-to-ground missions than any other comparable aircraft in history. Throughout the 1960s and 70s, the Soviets developed various missiles to attack at different altitude bands, making it impossible to fly under or over the missile threat. You had to confront it directly. One way to address this was to prioritize the suppression of enemy air defenses, specifically by destroying missile sites and their radars as the most crucial mission for the Air Force. By the 1970s, air superiority had once again become a top priority leading the US Air Force to commit to building its first pure air superiority fighter, which would eventually become the F-15 Eagle. I have never seen a finer joint government industry team that's organized with the technical competence to carry out the job that's been assigned to them, or to do it in a manner of close-knit teamwork. However, just as the F-15s became operational in 1978, Alarming new evidence suggested that their superiority might be short-lived. At the same time, and perhaps most importantly, reconnaissance satellites photographed several new fighter prototypes, the Mikoyan MiG-29 and the Sequoia T-10 at the Romanskoya Flight Test Center near Zukovsky, about 40 miles southeast of Moscow. This new generation represented a significant improvement in capability over anything previously observed by US intelligence services. It was clear to everyone involved that a new air-to-air -air combat platform would be necessary to counter the threat posed by these new Russian aircraft. The Sequoia T-10 was a huge shock to Western analysts. It was larger than the F-15 and far bigger than any previous Soviet-built fighter. If the MiG-29 had already concerned the American military establishment, the existence of the Sequoia T-10 set off alarm bells. These aircraft were highly advanced, capable of competing with some of the top NATO fighters like the Phantom and ultimately the F-15. Just weeks into his first term, America's 40th president increased US defense spending by $32.5 billion, initiating a massive rearmament of the United States. And it's one that I mentioned earlier. It is absolutely essential that we increase our spending for national defense if we're to preserve the peace. In 1981, the Cold War was heating up. As Reagan and Brezhnev faced off, the US Air Force concluded 
that it urgently needed a replacement for its F-15, an advanced tactical fighter, ATF, that would have no equal. As American planners began developing the concept of air-land battle to prepare for potential World War III, the US Air Force started considering the type of equipment it would need for such a conflict. On August 24, 1982, a Program Management Directive PMD, was issued, changing the program element's name from Combat Aircraft Technology to Advanced Tactical Fighter. Concurrently, two sub-projects were established under this banner. The Advanced Tactical Fighter, which included concept and technology development, seven airframe companies, Boeing, General Dynamics, Grumman, Lockheed, McDonnell Douglas, Northrop and Rockwell, each received $1 million concept development investigation contracts, and the Joint Fighter Engine, an engine technology demonstration program managed jointly with the US Navy. Pratt & Whitney and General Electric each received contracts valued at $202 million in September 1983. Other companies contending for the contract included Allison, Garrett and Teledyne CAE. The seven competing companies submitted a total of 19 conceptual designs, ranging from Northrop's lightweight cooperative fighter, smaller than an F-16, to Lockheed's battle cruiser, based on the design of their short-lived YF-12A long-range interceptor. Additionally, an in-house design, a subsonic low-observable fighter, was submitted by the Air Force's Flight Dynamics Laboratory, AFFDL. Of the approximately 19 studies submitted, four were eventually chosen to represent different mission philosophies. A very light, austere, low-cost design, a supersonic cruise and maneuver design, a subsonic, low-observable design, and a high-mac, high-altitude design. From these, it was concluded that the ideal air-to-air -air platform would combine low observability with supercruise and superior maneuverability. This platform would, in turn, offer reduced vulnerability to surface-to-air missiles while nearly eliminating exposure to anti-aircraft artillery, AAA, and other short-range systems. The Red Baron study, which analysed air-to-air combat in Vietnam, had sparked the race for stealth technology. An operational analysis of the Vietnam War showed that most aircraft were shot down by enemy aircraft they'd not seen. This highlighted the significant advantage of being undetected in air combat. Air combat data from World War II and Korea reinforced the need for invisibility. The principle of stealth technology is to make an airplane virtually invisible to the enemy. An aircraft's shape must reflect incoming radio waves away from enemy radar, rather than towards it. To further enhance low observability characteristics, an airplane is covered in materials that absorb radar signals, further reducing its visibility on a radar screen. Leading the way in stealth technology was Lockheed Skunk Works. In 1977, amid unprecedented security, Lockheed had flown a prototype of the world's first stealth fighter. By the 1980s, during Operation Just Cause, its F-117 had helped to dismantle General Noriega's regime in Panama. Now, the US Air Force decided that any new fighter must incorporate stealth technology and identify two other areas in which a future air superiority fighter should excel. The challenge was issued, and it was up to the finest aviation manufacturers in the world to respond. The Advanced Tactical Fighter Program was about to begin, and the Raptor, America's fifth-generation fighter, was about to be hatched. By 1983, US-Soviet relations had reached a new low. Following Leonid Brezhnev's death, the Politburo, now controlled by former KGB boss Yuri Andropov, was labelled by Reagan as the focus of evil in the modern world. Continuing his policy of rearmament, Reagan announced plans for the Strategic Defence Initiative, better known as Star Wars, prompting a furious reaction from Moscow. That we could intercept 
and destroy strategic ballistic missiles before they reached our own soil or that of our allies. I know this is a formidable technical task, one that may not be accomplished before the end of this century. I call upon the scientific community in our country, those who gave us nuclear weapons, to turn their great talents now to the cause of mankind and world peace, to give us the means of rendering these nuclear weapons impotent and obsolete. In August, when Korean Airlines Flight 007, on its way to Seoul from New York, strays several hundred miles off course into Soviet airspace, Russia responded. A fighter was dispatched, and the civilian airliner, with 269 people on board, was shot down. The shooting down of KAL 007 sent shockwaves around the world, straining international relations to the breaking point. Reagan's reaction to the crisis strengthened US conviction that stealth would now be the prime requirement for America's new fighter. I'd like to talk for a moment about why we're developing a new fighter at this time. There's probably not a person in this room uh, or in the reach of your television cameras who isn't aware of the contribution of stealth to our success in Desert Storm. In that case, it was a bombing capability that we were seeing in action. Uh, but the principle will apply to both ground attack and air-to-air -air missions in the future. The ATF is intended to replace the aging F-15 Eagle, currently our frontline fighter. The Air Force's F-15s are outstanding aircraft, and they swept the skies in Desert Storm. However, when the ATF is first deployed, the F-15s will be over 25 years old. Several other aircraft, including some we faced in Desert Storm, are aerodynamically competitive today with the F-15 and other leading U.S. fighters. We win today with an edge in avionics and by relying on the superior skill and training of our pilots. Others will try to close that gap between now and the year 2002, when the first ATF squadron is fielded. The ATF will balance stealth, supercruise, and advanced avionics in a highly maneuverable fighter that will ensure that our pilots get first look and first kill. Thus, the ATF will ensure American air superiority well into the next century. As we have seen in Desert Storm, Air superiority is essential to effective air and ground operations. American ground forces have not had to fight without air superiority since 1942, and we plan to keep it that way as well. Following four initial drafts, the basic framework for the ATF requirement was released to the industry. This framework called for a radius of action of approximately 800 miles, supersonic cruise capability of 1.4 to 1.5 Mach, a 2,000-foot runway requirement, a gross takeoff weight of 50,000 pounds, and a unit cost of no more than $40 million in 1985 dollars. Importantly, the proposal implied that the ATF Life Cycle Cost, LCC, the aircraft unit cost upon delivery plus the cost of all spares, fuel, maintenance and flying, should be at least as good as, if not better, than the McDonnell Douglas F-15. It was concluded that the submissions from Lockheed and Northrop were superior to those from Boeing, General Dynamics and McDonnell Douglas. Each manufacturer would submit a design for the Demonstration Evaluation or DEMVAL competition, with the understanding that the winning company would be the prime contractor and its partners would be subcontracted to produce major components. Lockheed, whose initial design studies had been considered front-runners during the early ATF reviews, had begun consortium discussions with Boeing and General Dynamics as early as June 1986. A public announcement was made on July the 2nd, but didn't formalise an agreement with its partners until the following October the 13th. Consequently, Lockheed assigned Sherman Mullin as general manager for the ATF team program office. Mullin would lead Lockheed in the prime contractor role, leveraging the unique technical strengths of both Boeing and General Dynamics. Two weeks later, Northrop followed suit by leading a team with McDonnell Douglas. In response to these teaming decisions, revised proposals from all seven airframe contractors 
was submitted on July 28, 1986. By default, the two consortia were selected on October 31, 1986 to build two prototypes, each for the revised demonstration and validation phase. Lockheed, under a $691 million contract, would build two of what later became its Model 1132 aircraft, initially referred to as Configuration 092, under the official Air Force designation YF-22. Northrop, under a similar $691 million contract, would build two of its N-14 proposal under the official Air Force designation YF-23. At the end of the process, one of these designs would become America's new advanced tactical fighter. Costing billions of dollars, the new fighter aimed to make a significant technological leap into the 21st century. Just nine months after being selected to build the demonstration and validation fighters for the US Air Force, Lockheed shocked everyone by scrapping its original design. In a hectic three-month process, with help from its partners, Lockheed produced a completely different configuration, featuring a clipped delta wing. Over the next four years, at a cost of just over $2 billion, America's tactical fighter competition became the largest program of its kind. In 1990, just months after the disintegration of the Soviet Union, the shapes of the two rival designs were finally unveiled. Northrop's version, called the YF-23, closely resembled its original design. In contrast, Lockheed's design, called the YF-22, appeared surprisingly conventional, featuring four tail surfaces, vectored thrust, a broad solid body, and a conventional wing. Unlike Lockheed's other stealth aircraft, the F-117, radar absorbent materials were not applied over the entire F-A-22, but used selectively on its edges, cavities, and critical surface areas. The F-22 carries its weapons internally. Four weapons bays are hidden in the central mid-body section. Six missiles can be carried in the ventral bays, which are covered with bi-fold doors. The side bays each hold one Sidewinder missile on a trapeze launcher. The mid-body section also houses the fighter's landing gear and complex inlet ducts. Attached to the mid-body is the forebody, which accommodates the cockpit and advanced avionics. Both the YF-23 and the YF-22 are impressive-looking machines, but their performance still needs to be tested. The most crucial stage of the competition is still to come, the flight testing. Northrop was first in the air. In August 1990, flown by Paul Metz, the YF-23 got airborne. The test was a huge success, but Lockheed was quick to respond. On September the 29th, at Edwards Air Force Base in California, Lockheed Chief Test Pilot Dave Ferguson prepared the Raptor for its maiden flight. Over the next three months, the Raptor underwent a series of rigorous tests. The Air Force required both teams to provide performance projections, which would then be compared with the actual performance of the airplanes in various conditions including subsonic and supersonic flight at different altitudes. The winner of this stage would earn a contract for 650 aircraft. The decision would hinge not just on what the contractors promised, but on the Air Force's confidence in their ability to deliver. During flight testing, the Raptor outperformed the Northrop YF-23 in several crucial performance areas. The YF-22 had clearly demonstrated that in every category, it was far superior to any existing fighter. But it would be events in 1991 that would carve out the Raptor's future. The two aircraft uh, uh, you see here, or you've seen in action in the flying prototypes, I think are an excellent demonstration of uh, exactly what we were trying to accomplish with this demonstration validation front end uh, and the prototyping uh, uh, and uh, hardware demonstration, including the avionics test beds that went along with that. Uh, we ended up with two aircraft, 
each one of which could meet the Air Force's technical uh, specifications and technical requirements. And that's why, uh, the, uh, as I said in the uh, formal remarks, that uh, we had here a, uh, a set of proposals or a set of, uh, of, uh, of uh, contract options, any one of which was in the acceptable range and any one of which could have been selected. So we were dealing with uh, shades of differences given that all of the proposals were in the acceptable range we had to make the evaluation based on the criteria that uh, uh, that uh, were called out in the RFP and we've done that and uh, the best I can do for you today is to report the final judgment of that process. 22 minutes after midnight on January the 17th 1991 Lockheed's stealth F-117 spearheaded US strikes against Saddam Hussein's regime. The performance of Lockheed's stealth bombers during Operation Desert Storm gave the company and its aircraft priceless publicity. However, another aircraft also emerged from the Gulf War with a glowing reputation. The F-15, the aircraft destined to be replaced by the ATF, emphatically confirmed its status as the foremost air superiority fighter in the world. Now, it appeared that the need for an advanced stealth fighter, the F-22, might be unfounded. But not everyone agreed. By April 1991, bogged down by the F-15 debate, the US Air Force prepared to announce the winner of the advanced tactical fighter contract. Would the Raptor emerge from the controversy unscathed? After the Denval flight tests of the prototypes, the Secretary of the Air Force, Donald Rice, announced that the Lockheed team and Pratt and & Whitney were the winners of the ATF and engine competitions. The DEMVAL phase has accomplished the risk reduction and the design trade-offs that are its purpose. Its success is demonstrable uh, in the excellent performance of the prototypes and the quality of the proposals from the contractor teams. To ensure the fairest possible evaluation of these outstanding designs and development teams, the evaluation process that we've been through has been intensive, thorough, and professional. That evaluation was conducted by Air Force and Navy teams, by a team involving both Air Force and Navy personnel, included not only the developer community, uh, but users, testers, contracts experts, cost analysts, and all who would be involved in the next phase of development. The success of the demonstration validation phase and this formal evaluation process is also demonstrated by the fact that the evaluators were able to bring to me as the source selection authority four awardable contracts, each of which represented acceptable proposals that met Air Force requirements. However, in evaluating the engine and airframe proposals, one combination clearly offered better capability with lower cost, thereby providing the Air Force with a true best value. With all that said, I now announce that the ATF team will be composed of the Pratt & Whitney Company who designed the F-119 engine, which will be integrated into the F-22 designed by Lockheed, team with Boeing and General Dynamics, the YF-23 design was considered stealthier and faster, while the YF-22, with its thrust vectoring nozzles, was more maneuverable as well as less expensive and risky. Having won the contract, Lockheed announced that it would locate the F-22's headquarters in Georgia, where the Raptor's forward fuselage would be built. General Dynamics would construct the F-22's mid-body section in Fort Worth, Texas, and Boeing would manufacture the wings and tail in Seattle, Washington. Follow-on work with the aircraft took place at Edwards Air Force Base, involving an additional 100 hours of flying time, approximately 25 flights, to expand the YF-22A's flight envelope and to explore specific segments in greater detail. However, on April 25, 1992, the program encountered its first major setback. During preliminary testing, the YF-22, flown by Tom Morgenfeld, crashed shortly after takeoff. The aircraft hit the runway with the landing gear retracted, 
skidded approximately 8,000 feet and caught fire. A key element of the Raptor's design, thrust vectoring, uses movable exhaust nozzles to adjust the angle of thrust from the two Pratt & Whitney engines. As the Raptor made its low-level flyby, Tom Morgenfeld kept the stick forward to keep the nose down. However, as the landing gear was retracted, the thrust vectoring engaged, pushing the aircraft towards the tarmac. The pilot struggled to correct this sudden change in direction as the Raptor began to veer off course. Despite the loss of the stealth aircraft, the program had achieved its major goals. 10 million man-hours of analysis, 4,000 hours of radar testing, and hundreds of hours of flight testing had gone into the aircraft's development, even before construction began. In fact, the F-22 had undergone more flight testing than any other fighter before full-scale production. On April the 9th, the first F-22A, officially named Raptor, an earlier attempt to name the aircraft Superstar failed in 1991, was unveiled in a public ceremony at Lockheed Martin's Marietta, Georgia facility. Air Force pilots would soon have the opportunity to evaluate the new aircraft themselves. First flown by the Air Force in 1997, Pilots at Edwards Air Force Base surpassed 2,000 flight test hours in over 900 missions. One of the key advances in the Raptor's design is its advanced cockpit and integrated avionics systems. Key mission systems include the Sanders General Electric Electronic Warfare System, the Martin Marietta Infrared and Ultraviolet Missile Launch Detector, the Westinghouse Texas Instruments Active Electronically Scanned Array Radar, the TRW Communication Navigation Identification Suite, and the Long Range Advanced IRST currently being tested. The Electronic Support Measures Systems Radio Frequency Receivers give the aircraft the ability to perform intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance tasks. The F-22 features a glass cockpit with all digital flight instruments. The monochrome head-up display offers a wide field of view and serves as a primary flight instrument, while information is also displayed on six color liquid crystal display LCD panels. The ejection seat in the F-22 is a version of the ACES-2, commonly used in USAF aircraft, featuring a center-mounted ejection control. The F-22 is equipped with a sophisticated life support system, including an onboard oxygen generation system, protective pilot garments, and a breathing regulator anti-G valve that controls the flow and pressure to the pilot's mask and garments. The Raptor carries a formidable array of ordnance. It has three internal weapons bays, a large main bay located on the bottom of the fuselage and two smaller bays situated on the sides of the fuselage, aft of the engine inlets. The main bay is divided along the center line and can accommodate six launchers for beyond visual range missiles, while each side bay contains a launcher for short range missiles. The primary air to air missiles are the AIM 120 AMRAAM and the AIM 9 Sidewinder with plans to integrate the AIM-260 JATM in the future. Missile launchers require the bay doors to be open for less than a second. During this brief time, pneumatic or hydraulic arms push the missiles clear of the aircraft to minimize detection and allow deployment during high-speed flight. Although the F-22 typically carries its weapons internally, the wings feature four hardpoints each rated to handle 5,000 pounds, 2,300 kilograms. Each hardpoint can be equipped with a pylon, capable of carrying a detachable 600-gallon, 2,270-litre external fuel tank, or a launcher holding two air-to-air -air missiles. In addition to its armament of eight missiles, the fighter is also equipped with a gun. At one point, during the evolution of the Advanced Tactical Fighter Program, 
the US Air Force considered eliminating the gun to save weight. By the late 1990s, pilots involved in the Raptor program were confident that their aircraft could easily outperform and defeat any other fighter. This confidence, however, was based primarily on controlled flight and missile firing exercises. What these pilots truly needed was combat experience, and they were about to get it. The F-22 is equipped with an internally mounted M61A2 Vulcan 20mm rotary cannon embedded in the right wing route with the muzzle covered by a retractable door. The cannon's firing path is displayed on the pilot's head-up display. Before the F-22 Raptor enters operational service with the US Air Force in the autumn of 2005, it will undergo thousands of hours of rigorous combat testing. Despite this, critics of the F-22 program argued that the F-15 Eagle, which the Raptor is intended to replace, already possesses the attributes necessary to remain the world's premier air superiority fighter well into the new millennium. This view is dismissed by the US Air Force. In March 2003, supporters of the F-15 were given the opportunity to test whether the Eagle was still the best fighter in the sky. Five F-15s were pitted against a single Raptor in a head-to-head -head exercise. Although no missiles were used, the sorties closely resembled actual combat, with no quarter given by either side. It was a kill or be killed scenario. All five F-15s were piloted by experienced F-22 pilots. One by one, the Raptor brought them down. In these combat tests against F-15s, the F-22 Raptor decisively proved its critics wrong. In December 2005, the USAF announced that the F-22 had achieved initial operational capability. During Exercise Northern Edge in Alaska in June 2006, 12 F-22s engaged in simulated combat exercises, downing 108 adversaries with no losses. Over the course of these exercises, the F-22 achieved 241 kills against two losses, neither of which involved an F-22. Due to US federal law aimed at protecting its stealth technology and classified features, the F-22 cannot be exported. Instead, US fighter customers are opting for earlier models like the F-15 Eagle and the F-16 Fighting Falcon or the newer F-35 Lightning II. The F-35 incorporates some technology from the F-22, but is designed to be more affordable, flexible and exportable. Originally, the USAF planned to acquire 750 ATFs. However, by 2009, the program was cut to 187 operational aircraft due to high costs, a lack of air-to-air -air missions because of the focus on counter-insurgency operations, a ban on exports, and the development of the more affordable and versatile F-35. The last F-22 was delivered in 2012. The F-22 Raptor was conceived amid Cold War fears that Russian-made fighters might outclass the F-15. Yet, as the world has evolved since the Cold War, the United States Air Force remains the sole operator of the F-22. As of August 2022, it has 183 aircraft in its inventory. In today's changing world, there are few certainties, but the F-22's dominance over the skies remains one of them. It's an early summer evening in an airfield in Georgia. The tension as palpable as the humidity. A new plane is scheduled to make its first flight tomorrow and things have to go well. The F-22 Raptor is a fighter for the next century. This conglomeration of titanium, aluminium and thermoplastics incorporates bold and forward thinking designs. 
It possesses speed, stealth, and flight control systems designed to give its pilot overwhelming superiority against the current and future enemy weapon systems. It's the fighter that today's children may fly tomorrow. With it, they will be masters of future air war, capable of overwhelming an enemy into submission. More than 10 years of work and complicated web of contractors and subcontractors in 46 states have gone into producing this next generation fighter. But already the Raptor has a troubled past. First, the Air Force made demands for fighter capabilities, but no one was sure they could be met. The funding cuts caused restructuring and repeated delays in development. A prototype crash. A subsequent version had so many problems, its first test flight was delayed for months. The plane is faced and still faces criticism from advocates of other planes and from Congress, which has been fretting over the F-22's cost. The last thing the plane's supporters need now is a bungled test flight that adds to the criticism and further clouds the future. The people who know this plane immediately believe this is what America needed for the future. They are as ardent in the support for the F-22 as the critics are opposing in it. By throwing the phrase once upon a time, so there are going to be two kinds of airplanes. There's F-22s and there's targets. But there are tests to be passed. And tomorrow will be one of them. Inside Building B-1 at Lockheed Martin Aeronautical Systems in Marietta, Georgia, a deceptive peacefulness hangs over the assembly line. Work here is also done after months of preparation. An aircraft assembled here will take flight for its first time. A major milestone for even the simplest airframe. Sitting on a ramp some two miles away, the F-22 is not scheduled to take off for at least six hours, but already crew members are hard at work. They double-check and triple-check every last inch of the aircraft. Absolutely no one wants their assembly, their system, their one small piece in this $187 million puzzle to go awry. In fact, components on the ship 4002, as the aircraft is known here, have been meticulously tested and retested ever since the plane rolled out of the assembly hangar in February, some four months ago now. The day has come for this aircraft's maiden flight. The F-22 cannot stumble. The Raptor must accomplish what is called a flight with no squawks. That is a test flight that goes off without a hitch. At 5 a.m., the pace of preparations starts to pick up. No detail, however small, can be overlooked. Not even the removal of a potentially damaging pebble. A cleaning truck patrols the ramp area, vacuuming up such debris. Lockheed Martin's security officer, Patty Howarth, holds a quick briefing to remind her staff of their priorities. Everybody forgot everything they learned on how to drive on the flight line, and every single person who had a flight line pass was after driving on Friday. Everyone. Howarth will spend the rest of the morning making sure her security team keeps the taxiway clear. Then, she will join on the rescue team standing by to assist with security in the case something goes wrong. Patty also worked on the security detail when Ship One flew for the first time. It was probably one of the greatest days of my life. I've never really been involved in aircraft, and I thought, oh, it'll just be another day. But it was probably 110 the first day it lifted off, and I had goosebumps going up my spine. Thank you. As the sun rises, responsibilities are handed off from the night crew to the crew that will launch the plane. Crew Chief Terry Byer oversees it all, supervising every crew member working on the F-22 today. He's been up since 2 a.m. A very vested personal interest. Uh, very little sleep last night. Uh, toss and turn. It's been eight years to get this far, so it's, uh, we're looking forward to a fun day. Among buyer's responsibilities this morning is ensuring all instrumentation and systems are functioning, so the team can get data on the plane's performance. That data will flow back to a control room here at Marietta. 
is very important in the program that we've demonstrated not only to uh, the company people, but to uh, the General America and Congress that this airplane can be built here in Marietta and we have competent people. We've, we've decreased our build time here by over three months and, and the number of write-ups that we have left open to do is down to a handful of write-ups versus the first airplane. We had significant things that we had to fix when we come back you know, as far as things that we couldn't complete to go fly. Meyer believes that won't be the case this time, but he won't know for sure until his flight is over. The man with the best vantage point to compare Ship 1 and Ship 2 is test pilot Paul Metz. Metz, who flew Raptor 1 on its first flight, is a former U.S. Air Force fighter pilot with more than 7,000 hours flight time and more than 33 years of experience. He's been the chief test pilot for the F-22 program since 1992. Uh, how dangerous is my job? They don't sell insurance too readily to us uh, for this job. But uh, quite frankly, uh, the job has become uh, much uh, safer and much more controlled. Uh, if you look back to the early days of flight test, uh, there were a great number of losses of life in aircraft. Uh, we're actually able to use simulators today to predict very, very well uh, what we're going to see. After several flights in the first F-22, Metz thinks the aircraft will endure itself to future pilots in a number of ways. From the simple things like uh, amazingly soft landings and, and the ability to feel really good about yourself when you come back from a flight uh, in terms of your ability to fly it, to uh, extreme maneuverability, to uh, cockpit displays and information that are beyond the realm of the current fighter pilot to envision, uh, and the ability to sneak around in space without people seeing you. Uh, all of these things together make for a tremendous package, and uh, the fighter pilots of the future are going to point to the F-22 as their favorite, I'm, I'm sure of that. On the ramp, the ground crew continues working. Myers is already pacing. Dan Stevens is the senior avionics technician for the F-22 program. He's responsible for the computers and other electronics on the aircraft to make sure they are functioning and ready when the pilot gets into the cockpit. Backing him up are a team of experts for every computer on the plane. We actually have IPT engineers that are ready for their systems as they develop problems that answer any questions. If I have a question, that I know who to go to. We have experts on every component on the aircraft. The F-22's pioneering electronics are perhaps the crew's biggest source of worry. They've undergone extensive testing, and Stephen believes most of the problems have been ironed out. But until this plane executes a flawless flight, Stevens won't be able to relax. All of us are putting uh, quite a bit of effort into it to see that it makes its goals, and especially this flight this morning. We're very proud of this aircraft, and we know it's going to take us through this millennium and beyond. The pride comes from long hours. Flight test engineer Hal Wyeth has been on the ramp since 3.30 a.m. Well, I broke a little sweat, but we're doing real good. His team has actually been running final checks since last night. But for Wyeth and his crew, the payoff will come the same way it did with Ship One, with a successful flight. Wyeth recalls how he felt watching the flight of the first F-22. When he actually rotated and broke ground, it was a great feeling after all the effort that's been put in by so many people. Uh, yeah, you know, a little lump in your heart, you know, that kind of thing. Today, however, the emotions may run deepest for this man. Vincent Devino is the team leader for airworthiness and delivery crew. He's been sheep herding the F-22 from the beginning, sweating the details for 10 years. I couldn't begin to count them. Uh, you know, you're looking at you're looking at everything here from the airplane uh, readiness, fueling, uh, security of the ramp, uh, making sure you have the right number of people and the right and the right skills uh, aboard. There's there's quite a few things that uh, that go into uh, you know, saying the airplane is ready for flight. But this will be the last time Davino has to officially worry about a flight. After four decades in the business, he's retiring. Into failed or delayed test flights is not how he wants to end his career. A lot of emotion goes along with it. Why? Like, uh, you know, there's a lot of time and uh, 42 years of uh, experience in his business about to uh, 
Come to a close here. As it sits on the map this morning, the Raptor is just a couple of miles from where it was assembled, but Ship 2 is years removed from its birth, and in terms of technology, light years beyond its ancestors. The impetus for the F-22 began in 1981, when the Air Force announced that it needed a new air superiority fighter. Fighters such as the French Rafale, the Eurofighter Typhoon, and new generations of Russian Sukhoi and MiG have steadily reached parity with, and in some cases surpassed, the F-15. Additionally, Russian-made SA-10 and SA-12 air defense missiles could shoot down an F-15. They were for sale to any country with enough money to buy them. So the Air Force began looking for a new fighter that, once again, would allow the U.S. to leapfrog the lethal competition. The F-22 is going to help us own the skies, and owning the skies is what will allow us uh, to dominate future battlefields in a way that will enable every other part of our military force, whether it be forces on the ground, at sea, or in the air, owning the sky makes everything else work. The new fighter would need the classic ingredients of air superiority. Speed and agility. Comprehensive situational awareness. The ability to shoot before being seen. And the ability to elude ground threats. But the Air Force decided it wanted to look far into the future. To a fighter that would be superior starting in 2004 and dominate at least 25 years beyond that. That meant a huge leap into the next millennium for the aircraft designers. They would have to predict future enemy capabilities and concoct a fighter that could respond with overwhelming superiority. But asking manufacturers to look that far ahead was like asking designers at the P-51 to foresee the impact of jet propulsion and predict the development of the F-4 Phantom 25 years later. Design teams look for the 1980s equivalent of the development of jet propulsion. They found it in the computer. By 1986, a profound shift away from massive mainframe computers had begun with the miniaturization of electronics that opened new possibilities for design of the fighter for the next millennium. Under development at the time was stealth technology. Stealth modifies a plane's physical characteristics Primarily, its external surfaces and heat signatures to reduce its radar profile. The Air Force had already begun huge leaps in stealth with its F-117 fighter and B-2 bomber. Strategists have called for such an aircraft as the need and development for small expeditional forces to respond to regional conflicts around the globe. The stealth aircraft offered a perfect fit for such operations, in that it could carry out a mission quickly, with precision, without detection, and without the need for support aircraft. And stealth became a requirement for the new fighter. The Air Force also demanded that it fly at supersonic speeds without afterburner. Designers, mindful of the requirement for domination in the next century, also proposed a fighter that used easily upgradable computers. The computers would provide the pilot seamless situational information. To get on top of it, and it's yeah. coming back downhill. Computers would also coordinate with the other stealth technology to deny the enemy information about the plane's whereabouts. The idea was to have a plane that would give its pilot first look, first shot, first kill capabilities, then zoom away undetected, until the initial targets exploded. A third consideration arose from Congress. Federal budget constraints likely would limit the number of planes built, so the new fighters would have to be more with fewer numbers. They would have to be more destructive and deadly, and allow the U.S. to win quickly and decisively, with minimal casualties to Americans. This airplane is the future of our country. Uh, it will allow us to own the skies over any future battlefield, and owning the skies over those battlefields is going to keep Americans alive. And that's what the mothers and fathers of America are going to want. 
but this futuristic vision required a lot of work. The avionics goal alone seemed huge. In 1986, close to impossible. Computers that could handle all the plane's requirements didn't exist. Design teams fretted over whether they could pull off this new airplane. Nevertheless, they forged ahead. In 1986, the Air Force selected two teams of defense contractors, Lockheed, Boeing, General Dynamics, and Northrop McDonnell Douglas, to build prototype airplanes known as the YF-22 and the YF-23. Engine makers Pratt & Whitney and General Electric were selected to build prototype engines, and all the Air Force would have four versions of this new plane to consider. The prototypes materialized and began test flights in 1990. Northrop McDonnell Douglas's YF-23 was a graceful aircraft with forward fuselage resembling a gooseneck stretched out in flight. Its wings created a clip diamond pattern with all edges swept forward or back by 40 degrees. When viewed from above, its broadly angled twin tails propelled the wing's leading edges. The YF-22 supported a slightly more conventional look particularly in its shapely jutting twin tails and the more triangular shape of its wings. Designers of both planes incorporated several key developments in stealth, high-speed cruising, and avionics. To increase the fighter's stealth, designers reshaped internal and external parts of the aircraft. They changed how they treated its external surfaces through coating and irregular shapes. Designers also manipulated the plane's heat emissions to mask the fighters from infrared or heat-seeking detectors. The engine makers helped by reducing the need for afterburner to go supersonic. Also modified were the fighters' noises and colors to make it harder to detect by sonar and by the human eye. Ultimately, the fighters' radar cross-section, the element most crucial to foiling the enemy, was reduced until it resembled radar signature of birds and bees. Speed was another way the designers boosted the fighter's air superiority. Conventional fighters get their supersonic speeds through afterburner. But this consumes excessive amounts of fuel and can be used only for a short amount of time. The F-22 Pratt & Whitney engines can develop 35,000 pounds of thrust and push the Raptor to well above Mach 1 without using afterburner. That means the fighter can fly at supersonic speeds for longer periods of time, giving it a greater range of operation and enemies less time to react. Designers call this capability Super Cruise. It significantly exceeds the capabilities of engines powering the Air Force current F-15 and F-16 fighters. Finally, the designers incorporated the latest developments into computers to create avionics that give the pilots superior situational awareness. Everything a fighter pilot needs to know, from the location of his wingman and his target to enemy aircraft and radar sectors, is combined into a series of easily understood displays an enemy aircraft is a red triangle, an unidentified aircraft is a yellow square. Our green square is a friendly aircraft. Wingmen are in blue. All the pilot has to do is to glance down to a situational display and instantly grasp the battlefield around them. In fact, we bring in people who have no flight experience whatsoever. Put them in the concept demonstrator, let them use uh, displays that are very close, very similar to what's actually in the airplane. And uh, to a person, they can operate the systems, lock onto targets, and destroy enemy aircraft. Finally, the Air Force demanded that this new fighter demonstrate superior agility. On the YF-23, agility was attained through traditional means, aerodynamics and flight control surfaces. But the YAF-22 added thrust vectoring using nozzles on the back of the engine to direct thrust up or down. With thrust vectoring, the YAF-22 achieved a record high angle of attack, 60 degrees, an angle that would stall most other aircraft. 
I now announce... In April 1991, U.S. Air Force Secretary Dr. Donald Rice announced that the YF-22 with its Pratt & Whitney F-119 engines would be the design for its future advanced tactical fighter, citing better capabilities and lower costs. The Air Force awarded the winning team a $9.5 billion contract. While design work began on the newly dubbed F-22, the Air Force continued test flights on the YF version. On April 22, 1992, while returning to Edwards Air Force Base in California, the YF-22 began oscillating severely, 40 feet above the runway. Pilot was unable to regain control. The YF-22 crashed and burned. The Air Force's prototype YF-22 aircraft crashed April 25th at Edwards Air Force Base as the pilot was completing a practice approach over the runway. The investigation into the crash of the YF-22 tied it to the thrust vectors. They had been left on during the landing and contributed to the oscillation as the pilot moved that control stick. The crash was labeled a pilot error. The pilot himself rode off the crash and walked away from the airplane. F-22 Chief Test Pilot Paul Metz joined the F-22 program shortly afterwards. The problem was one of having a prototype flight control system uh, that was not designed to be used in that flight environment. Um, and uh, it had some sensitivities, some known sensitivities. And unfortunately, it caught uh, that particular pilot uh, on that particular day and, uh, and caused the resulting accident. The thrust vectors were integrated into the flight controls, eliminating the need to turn them on and off. Now, they automatically interpret the pilot's movements on the aircraft stick. The harder a pilot pulls on the stick, the more thrust vectoring the flight control system will provide. All of those commands from the pilot go through a computer, and the computer then manipulates or modulates those control surfaces depending on the flight condition. Um, I I like to think of the vector as simply being like a bigger aerodynamic tail on the airplane. They make the airplane move and pitch, uh, and uh, the pilot has no idea that part of that pitch is from the engines, part of the pitch is from the horizontal tail. It's all transparent. While the crash was a setback for the F-22 program, the Air Force's interest in the fighter never diminished. My position for about 10 miles. The impact. Operation Desert Storm in 1991 proved that a fighter with its capabilities was still needed. Uh, I think we expect what we saw in Desert Storm, that is, a clear, decisive, overwhelming show of force that ended the war very quickly with a minimal loss of life of our, of our people. In the future, we should expect that of all of our equipment. Yeah, port 7-0, you got a friendly in front of you with a wife. Yeah, I see him. I see him. But the Gulf War raised the expectations of the American public for decisive conflicts of short duration. However, Desert Storm also reminded the F-22 designers of the need to be more flexible and ready to react to new problems, such as Iraq's Scud missile, for example. Many of our requirements were modified as a result of lessons learned in the Gulf War. Uh, hard to find relocatable launch targets, for example, uh, was one of the phenomena that, that was a fairly significant problem for the U.S. forces. Some of our systems on the airplane are designed to, to, to deal with that. The F-22 design team also had to react to rapid and ongoing changes in computer systems. In fact, one of the aircraft's newer features is flexibility for expansion and swapping out components. Capacity is available within the aircraft to add computer processor power. No hard mock-up of the plane was created. Instead, manufacturing plants in Fort Worth, Seattle, West Palm Beach, Florida, and East Hartford, Connecticut, all relied on computer-generated models for such key components. At final assembly in Marietta, these major sections of the aircraft fit remarkably well. In fact, Lockheed Martin claims that some tolerances were accurate to within one six thousandth of an inch. The development that proved most difficult to cope was with the ongoing downsizing of the U.S. military. 
The shrinking defense dollar at times hurt the fighter's development. The Defense Secretary William Cohen warned Congress that it would have to close more bases to pay for all the weapon systems if desired, but Congress shied away from that painful task. Fearful of the political repercussions that left new weapon systems such as the F-22 vulnerable to the Pentagon Budget Acts. Against this backdrop of uncertain federal support, Lockheed Martin unveiled within fanfare its first F-22. On April 9, 1997, the company announced that this aircraft would take its first flight by the end of the following month. But that first F-22 stumbled badly out of the gate. One problem followed after another, and the program quickly fell three months behind. Finally, on September 7, 1997, Metz took the first F-22 into the air. That flight tested the aircraft's handling characteristics and engine performance through different power levels. It retracted the gear for a clean configuration to test handling. And it tested the aircraft in formation with an F-16. The roughly one-hour flight demonstrated the plane could fly. Lockheed Martin and the Air Force called the problems that delayed the first F-22 minor, although the repairs were sometimes complicated. But the delays gave critics ammunition. A military cost review agency twice warned that the F-22 was a risk of billion dollars cost overruns. Congress complained too many technical problems and too few test flights. Senators warned that this $187 million plane might be stuck dead if its price per copy kept climbing. The F-22 supporters responded by reminding Congress the fighter was far from a conventional aircraft. Thus, its cost and development were unpredictable. In my personal opinion, uh, this program has had an unprecedented focus on cost and cost control. Uh, we have been a co what's termed a cost reimbursable contract, principally because we're busting the, the frontiers of many new technologies on this program, and you can't very accurately predict where that's going to lead you as you bring these technologies online. If you look at this program in terms of its complexity from any historical measure, we believe we're going to deliver the airplane about 25% under what many outside experts think it should cost. So that's rather revolutionary in its own. Haunted by criticism, this team at Lockheed Martin in Georgia redoubled its efforts. They have succeeded in getting the second F-22 ready for its test flight, a full nine days ahead of schedule. But being ready is not the full measure of success, and the pressure for a perfect flight only increased. At 9 a.m., Everyone who works on the F-22 flight line, from engineers to stockroom clerks, stops what they are doing and heads out to the runway. We're doing a fire walk this morning, and fire is fire and object damage. Any item, a pebble, a rock, um, in, any MSP item that might happen to be on the runway could damage the engine. And we are out here this morning to prevent that from happening. Flight walks are performed once or twice a week at fighter bases. But with this plane, FOD walks are done any time it is scheduled to have its engines running. The workers fan out and scan the pavement for anything that the vacuum truck may have missed. Something that small can nick an impeller blade and cause it to be off balance. It's bad enough, it comes apart just like a hand grenade in flight. So we want to be very careful that we get everything off the ramp that we can see. At the end of the walk, all the workers' bags are carefully collected. There is no prize for the worker who turns into a bag with the most debris. A <laughs> FOD-free airplane, that's the prize, no busted engines. With the FOD walk completed, the ground crew begins at its last-minute check. Optimism runs high, but it's short-lived. Suddenly, there is a problem. A small hydraulic leak has been discovered. The pre-flight timetable is halted. For how long? No one knows. Two hours have gone by. But relief? and optimism return. The hydraulic leak has been fixed. Test pilot Paul Metz arrives. He greets Bayer, the crew chief, 
and the two duo walk around inspection of the fighter. The boom on the F-22's nose reflects the test phase of this aircraft. The antenna sprouting from it will send data streaming back to the small white building. This is the nerve center for the test flight. The building is full of engineers who monitor every system on the F-22 while it's in flight. The ground crew conducts another FOD walk. It's now 11 a.m., and an anxious crowd of Lockheed employees and curious reporters have gathered to watch this F-22 make its first leap skyward. Metz climbs into the cockpit. Byer assists him in buckling up. Starting an F-22 is almost as easy as starting an antique car. Early designs required the pilot to complete 17 steps. But for all its complexity, this F-22 asked him to do just three things. Turn the battery on, push the auxiliary power, switch to start, and move both throttles to idle. The airplane's actually very simple to operate. It only takes a few switches to get it started. And once we get it started, we have to go through a number of checks with the airplane to get it ready for flight. Byers signals to Metz to bring up the power. Metz talks to both the tower and the control room. Running through more checklists on the ground, Bayer, the crew chief, listens in and paces some more. Now, the plane is ready for its initial move or roll check. Metz eases the jet half roll forward and taps the brakes. Bayer now begins signaling to Metz to head toward the runway. As he rolls out, Metz is engaged in a constant conversation with the control room, running checks for all his systems. He also talks to the pilot of the F-16 chase plane to coordinate takeoff and rendezvous. Metz taxis forward toward the runway, testing his rudder, closing down his engine nozzles. He stops again for what is called the last chance inspection. Bayer gives him a thumbs up, and hands them over to the tower. The aircraft rolls to the head of the runway and prepares for takeoff. It is now 11.30 a.m. The chase plane heads out. The F-16 will be Met's eyes outside of the plane, looking for problems visually verifying all aspects of the test flight. Now, the moment has come. All the months of effort boiled down to a single motion of the left hand. Metz eases the throttle forward and adds power to the engines. A few breathless seconds later, Raptor 2 takes flight. Immediately, the newly born plane physically and visibly gives notice of its sheer power. The nose lifts higher as it surges into a gravity-mocking climb. It's an initial performance that, Metz later will admit, even surprised him. The F-16 must go to afterburner to keep up. This is a real high point of the airplane. Pratt & Whitney's done a fantastic job with the, the engines. They operate very, very smoothly with almost no vibration. You can tell no difference between idle and military power. For all its excitement, the takeoff was not the culmination of today's effort. It was merely a beginning. There is a flight plan to be followed, and tests to be done. According to that flight plan, Metz will fly a triangular route over Georgia. He will head north to Jasper, 40 miles away. Then turn west for a 46-mile leg. Then turn south, and return to Dobbins and Marietta. After the initial climb, the F-22 slows to 200 knots and levels off. The gear stays down for the first test phase. While he cruises, Metz and the engineers run through checks of the aircraft systems, making sure all are working. Once everyone is convinced the plane is functioning correctly, it is time to check flight control systems. Time to make the Raptor move a little. The ailerons, the rudders, the thrust factors. As something moves, data goes streaming back to the white control building. Here we're seeing some control motions with the rudder. Again, just uh, relatively gentle maneuvers to see if the airplane responds just as predicted in the simulations. 
And it did. Now Metz brings the throttle forward again. The added power pushes the aircraft to 225 knots, and quickly, the two climb to 20,000 feet. Now comes a critical step. The landing gear is tested. It retracts smoothly and is lowered again. Then, raised for good. Putting the gear up represents an act of faith that it'll come back down. The first phase of the test flight is complete. It has not only gone smoothly, it has been perfect. Bring the gear up and take a look at the characteristics of the airplane in what we call a clean configuration. Landing gear comes up, and once it does, the airplane is very, very smooth. There's absolutely no buffet, and uh, characteristics are excellent. Everything done with the gear down is now repeated. Checking how the F-22 handles, how the engines respond. Again, with the gear up, we'll look at some of those relatively mild handling qualities characteristics, such as bank-to-bank -bank rolls and some of the control inputs. And again, the airplane is, is very quick, very cat-like and agile in the response. 40 minutes into flight, another milestone test. METS and the F-16 show the F-22's ability to fly in formation. And we use the cameraman as a director in this case to help me make rel relatively rapid and quick changes in position while flying the wing of the F-16 here. Finally, nearly an hour later, the test flights are over. There's just one thing left to do. Coming in close to final, the airplane uh, floats very nicely, can be flared, and touches down very softly. As they land, Metz holds up Raptor's nose to help slow the plane. Once on the ground, we hold the nose up for aero braking to bleed off some airspeed. I deployed the speed brakes just as the nose came down for touchdown. And that also helps dissipate the airspeed. With about 5,000 feet of runway remaining, brakes are applied, bringing the F-22 down to a fairly slow speed to finish the rollout. Handling characteristics in the landing phase are, are really delight. Uh, it'll make any pilot feel proud to bring the airplane back and land it. It's a uh, very easy airplane to land. As the spectators applaud, Metz brings forward the F-22 over towards them and lets the plane take a bow. These are the folks that are really responsible for getting me in the air. And there are thousands of people, not only uh, in Marietta, but Seattle, Fort Worth, Pratt & Whitney, and the suppliers around the United States and, in fact, around the world that uh, struggled for a long time to put this airplane together. Back at the ramp, the ground crew cheers. Metz leaves the cockpit. There are handshakes and photos all around for a successful test flight. It was by the book. The uh, flight profile was flown exactly as we had planned it out, and um, absolutely no anomalies on the airplane. It's uh, ready to go again. We don't have a squawk on either the instrumentation or the airframe itself. Anything unexpected, either good or bad? Well, you probably saw it on the climb out here. Uh, we rotated up to the climb at about three-fourths field and uh, really rocketed on up there. And both I, myself and the chase pilot both remarked that that was a lot spiffier performance than we saw with number one. And I, I can't explain it because it's a hotter day, but it really, it really went upstairs today. With the plane safely back on the ramp, buyer can finally stop pacing. Well, I guess a lot of things go through your mind. I mean, you think about fuel, you think about electrical power, but mainly is a uh, great feeling jumping off and um, made a few bets with the ground crew of how bad the airborne pickup would be. But he, Colonel uh, Rainey hit it pretty good. He was right with him. <laughs> oh, okay. Elation is pervasive among the ground crew. Fantastic. Got this airplane in the air early. Got it back. No squawks on it. Perfect. This successful test flight does much today to chase away the program's demons. The F-22 team has proven it can deliver a test flight early and with flawless results.
that should go far in helping others focus on what is really the aircraft's key selling points. Its maneuverability and speed, according to Metz. The most striking thing that you see when you get in it is the, is the raw power. And that's what's going to uh, be an eye-opener to the operational pilot. With its flawless test flight behind it, this F-22 will stick to its schedule and fly again in two days. After that, it will undergo some minor modifications, then be test flown about a half dozen more times. If those go well, the aircraft will then be ferried to Edwards Air Force Base in California. What will join the first F-22 in future test flights? The naysayers in Congress, meanwhile, will be forced to consider that this plane made its test flight nine days early without a single hitch and demonstrated some exciting fighter capabilities. I think the reliability we're seeing and our ability to hold to schedule with this complex system are both very strong testimony to the fact that the program's coming together. Bayer agrees. Well, I think it proves the Congress and the United States Air Force that Lockheed Martin can build a reliable fighter on time and, and below budget. Uh, the crews come together and they, they know what they're doing and we worked through some uh, trying times on the first aircraft, and but we learned and that's the biggest thing it showed. We learned from the difficulties we had and we've overcome them and now we're a month ahead of schedule. Now, Bayer is ready to announce the last step today for the crew. It's not more testing or more analysis or even reviews although those will surely go on as well. Well, I think everybody's going out tonight and uh, unwind a little bit, have a good time. So uh, we'll enjoy ourselves. To build Half Blue, we needed $10 million. One can't imagine what goes through the mind when you have to ask the board of directors to invest $10 million at a time when the corporation was considering declaring bankruptcy. That $10 million investment brought the company several billion dollars of sales in a reputation of technical superiority in stealth technology. The advantages of low observables or stealth technology have been a military matter of considerable interest for decades applicable not only to aircraft, but to all other forms of military equipment as well. Attempts to camouflage or reduce the visibility of hardware and personnel have been ongoing since the beginning of recorded military history. During World War II, the application of camouflage paint patterns was studied with considerable intensity. Scientifically conducted research helped generate patterns that genuinely reduced an aircraft's visibility both in the air and on the ground. Polished aluminum, for instance, was criticized for its notable ability to reflect sunlight and increase the detection distance of a target aircraft. Dull, non-glare matte-type paints eliminated this problem, but not without increased expense of some cost and performance. The exigencies of war curtailed extensive research into the development of an airworthy, non-radar reflective structural material, but some attempts were nevertheless made. The Germans in particular placed emphasis on lowering the radar return of select aircraft, including the notable Horton HO-229. This extremely advanced all-wing jet fighter, built primarily of wood over a steel tube load-bearing structure, in some production models was to have utilized a wood sandwich ply with a core material of granulated charcoal. Presumed to have absorbed radar energy, the charcoal was calculated to reduce the aircraft's radar return by a not insignificant margin. The war ended before the technology could be fully exploited. Countermeasures were slow to develop initially, with a little focus on reducing radar visibility or countering radar energy during the 1950s and 1960s. It wasn't until the Vietnam War that effective electronic countermeasures were pursued. The threat of radar-guided missiles required a reassessment of technology, leading to the development of ECM pods and shaft dispensers. Lockheed gained experience in anti-radar features through programs like the U-2, A-12, and SR-71. In 1974, DARPA requested studies for a low observable fighter, excluding Lockheed, but they were eventually included through the Skunk Works efforts. Lockheed refined external shipping techniques using Echo-1, a computer program predicting radar cross-section based on mathematical formulas. They employed faceting, creating a three-dimensional aircraft from flat panels to reduce RCS. 
Validation testing was conducted with a model called the Hopeless Diamond, demonstrating lower RCS than previous designs. In August of 1975, Lockheed, along with Boeing and Northrop, received invitations from the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency to participate in a highly competitive project known as the Experimental Stealth Testbed. The objective of this project was to develop and test an innovative aircraft design with exceptional low observability characteristics. After a thorough evaluation process, Lockheed was selected in April 1976 to proceed with the detailed design, development, and testing of the aircraft, which he named the Hap Blue. A single-seat subsonic aircraft featured a distinctive design aimed at achieving both high maneuverability and low observability. A significant feature of the aircraft was the inclusion of a large two-piston flap known as the platypus, which automatically deflected downward when the angle of attack exceeded 12 degrees, enhancing the nose down pitch control. The initial engine runs were accomplished on the first Hab Blue on November 4, 1977, at Lockheed's Burbank facility. In order to maintain security, the aircraft was parked between two semi-tractor trailers over which a camouflage net had been installed. On December 1, 1977, with Lockheed test pilot Bill Park at the controls, Hav Blue lifted into the air. A new era in military aviation had just begun. Only 20 months had passed since the contract award. As previously noted, the primary objective of the test program was to demonstrate VLO technology. Towards this end, Hav Blue 1001 would demonstrate load-slash-flutter performance handling qualities and stability control. Hav Blue 1002 was designated as a PCS test vehicle. Hav Blue 1001 accomplished 36 flights over the next five months and successfully expanded the flight envelope sufficiently to allow the RCS testing to be performed. Hav Blue 1002 joined the program during July 1978 and flew for the first time on July 20th with Air Force pilot Norman Ken Dyson at the controls. This aircraft differed from the Hab Blue 1001 in that it possessed a real airspeed system and did not have a drag chute installed. It also incorporated nose wheel steering to improve ground handling and was adorned with all the coatings and materials required to perform its intended task. Following some airspeed calibration flights, the aircraft accomplished 52 flights during the next 12 months and completed the low observable testing. The final phase of testing in a simulated integrated air defense environment was completed during July of 1979. The aircraft demonstrated its low observable capabilities against ground and airborne systems during these tests. Its low acoustic signature was also verified. The Have Blue program was a low-cost demonstration of a radically new concept in VLO aircraft design. Have Blue program accomplishments included from a technical standpoint, lowest RCS aircraft in the world by several orders of magnitude, VLO infrared signature, VLO visual signatures, VLO acoustic signature, and confirmation of complex aerodynamics. In conclusion, it was a determined VLO tactical and strategic aircraft could be designed, produced, and operated. I always felt it would perform very well, but I never expected it to perform as well as it did. We had not involved the airplane operationally, and therefore the operators didn't know how to use the airplane. It's like having a new tool, I was worried we hadn't operated it enough. The advantages of very low observables or stealth technology, once successfully demonstrated by Lockheed's Hap Blue prototypes, quickly led to a full-scale engineering development contract award from the Air Force on November 16, 1978. The fixed price production contract was signed 13 months later. It called for five full-scale development and 15 production models of a single-seat subsonic attack aircraft to be officially designated F-117A. Under program manager Norm Nelson, engineering on the new aircraft proceeded at a rapid pace, utilizing the database that had been developed under Hav Blue. The resulting unusual shape of the F-117 is the end product of low observables goals set for the aircraft at the program's beginning. Not surprisingly, it provided the aerodynamic and stability and control engineers with a significant challenge. The F-117A incorporates a variety of design features to significantly reduce aircraft signature. There are seven different types of observable signatures of concern. Radar, infrared, visual, contrails, engine smoke, acoustics, and electromagnetic emissions. Since the F-117A was a departure from normal aerodynamic design, a significant effort was made to reduce development risk by using several proven systems from existing aircraft. Some examples of this are the General Electric F-404 turbofan engine used in the McDonnell Douglas F-A-18 fighter, 
cockpit components from the General Dynamics F-16 and the McDonnell Douglas F-A-18 navigation and the tax systems, computers and electronics, off-the-shelf weapons, and modified fly-by-wire F-16 flight control system. All aircraft designs are a compromise in one form or another, with the primary mission objective dominating these characteristics. The primary mission of the F-117A is to penetrate and in the airspace, destroy high-value targets, and survive. Since low observability or stealth was the primary goal, it established the external configuration and in particular the sweep angles of the wings and tail. One of the larger challenges was to provide as much sweep as possible and still have sufficient aspect ratio for the needed lift over drag to achieve the required range. Another major challenge was to provide adequate control to achieve the desired maneuverability within a reasonable angle of attack range for an unstable aircraft in both pitch and yaw. The resulting control configuration was not conductive to low takeoff and landing speeds. The full span 11s could not be dropped for landing without leading edge devices or another means of pitch control. The solution was to use drag chute for landing and accept a longer takeoff rule. The brake system capacity was subsequently improved, reducing reliance on the drag chute. Another low observability design consideration was to provide very sharp leading edges. This is good for a supersonic airfoil, but not optimum for a subsonic aircraft. The Air Force was anxious for a new aircraft, having temporarily lost its new Boeing B-1 bomber to government compacts. Naturally, speculation in the aviation press centered around a full-size, advanced technology bomber. The new airplane might have escaped attention altogether, except that in 1980, the White House intentionally alluded to its existence. Whether this was an election year ploy remains open to question. The new aircraft, then popularly known as the Stealth Fighter, rather than the Stealth Bomber, was to become a hot aviation topic over the next decade. The new airplane was given a new code name, Senior Trend, as well as the deceptive designation of F-117. The first Stealth Fighters were flown by Lockheed C-5 Galaxy cargo plane to Groom Dry Lake, where they took to the air for the first time in June 1981. Security was, to put it mildly, tight. Unauthorized ground personnel were required to remain indoors when a scalp jet emerged from its hangar. Test flights were made mostly at night, their schedule arranged to avoid overflights by Soviet reconnaissance satellites. The Nellis Range is also home to the Air Force's Red Flag Air Combat Exercises, which involved the aircraft and pilots of American and several foreign military aviation services. Those other aircraft were kept away from the groom area by an airborne screen of security aircraft. Despite the F-117's 33% increase in physical size over the prototype, the Stealth Fighter's RCS measured between 0.01 and 0.001 square meters, about that of a small bird. For instance, compared to a McDonnell Douglas F-4G Phantom typically used for wild weasel anti-radar missions, which has a head-on RCS of 6 meters, the F-117 was able to get 90% closer to the ground-based search radars and 98% closer to the airborne radars before getting detected. Testing was still underway when the Air Force ordered an entire wing of the production version of Senior Trend, the F-117A Nighthawk. Until delivery of their F-117As, the pilots trained in Vought A-7D Corsair IIs. The first military pilot to fly a Nighthawk was Lt. Col. Alton C. Whitley, a Vietnam veteran with combat experience in the A-7 and North American F-100, and former commander of the Air Force's Aggressor Squadron. When I first looked at the F-117, he recalls, it reminded me of some Star Wars type of aircraft, I thought. Boy, this is the 21st century. Having outgrown the Groom Lake facilities, the stealth unit, now officially the 4450th Tactical Group, operated out of the remote Tono Path Test Range airfield in the northwest corner of the Nellis Range. Although overlooked by public land, the Tonopah facility was some 40 desert miles from the nearest town, sufficiently remote to discourage all but the most persistent observers. Pilots of the 4450th flew into Tonopah each Monday aboard a government-charted airliner for four nights of training before returned home on Friday afternoon. In June 1986, and again in October 1987, pilots flew their Nighthawks into the ground. Both incidents were attributed to pilot fatigue and disorientation. Despite U.S. Air Force efforts to the contrary, word filtered to the outside world. Finally, in November 1988, the Pentagon publicly revealed a grainy, retouched photo, notable mostly for how little it revealed of the F-117. By then, the 4450th, now activated as the 37th Tactical Fighter Wing, was combat ready. Twice, stealth fighters were within an hour of taking off to bomb targets in Libya, only to have their missions scrubbed to avoid revealing their existence. 
Not until December 1989 and the U.S. invasion of Panama, Operation Just Cause, did the F-117A see action. Refueling in mid-air, six Nighthawks made their way to Panama via Texas and the Caribbean Sea. Two of these were backup aircraft, which turned back unneeded. Two more were assigned to support Special Forces troops attempting to kidnap General Manuel Noriega, but their mission was scrubbed. Confusion over the last-minute change resulted in a mix-up over the remaining target, a barracks housing two battalions of elite enemy troops. The intent was not to kill, but to stun. The lead F-117A did just that with a single 2,000-pound Mark 84 bomb. Colloquially known as the Hammer, the bomb with a lethal radius of 400 feet and capable of blowing out eardrums half a mile away exploded in a field next to the barracks, throwing the Panamanians into confusion. The second stealth jet also hit its first aim point, which, however, turned out to be an error. Still, the Air Force declared the mission a success. After all, the stealth jets had gone unnoticed on Panamanian radar. On August 17, 1990, the 37th Tactical Fighter Wing received a new commander, Colonel Al Whitley. Four hours later, the colonel recalls, the word came in to deploy our first squadron. The United States and its allies plan to oust Saddam Hussein's Iraqis from Kuwait by force if necessary, and the Night Stalkers were among the first Allied units to deploy to Saudi Arabia. Located 6,500 feet up in the mountains near the Red Sea, King Khalid Air Base, nicknamed Tonopah East, had been built in the late 1970s in return for delivery of McDonnell Douglas's F-15 Eagle fighters and eight LUACS airborne sentries to Saudi Arabia. Because the base was well beyond the reach of Iraqi Scud B ballistic missiles, the stealth jets would require three mid-air refuelings, each in order to reach their main target, downtown Baghdad. I generally put the F-117s against the Baghdad targets, stated the Air Force's chief mission planner, Brigantine General Buster C. Glosson, where we would have lost airplanes. Mission personnel included only three combat veterans, Whitley, his deputy commander, and one just cause pilot. But five months later, after the F-117s were deployed to Saudi Arabia, the incessant training above the barren Nevada desert paid off. The Night Stalkers and Ghost Riders lugged two times of bombs apiece across more than 1,000 miles of nighttime desert. Shortly before 3 a.m. local time, January 17, 1991, eight black jets arrived, lights out and radio silent, above Baghdad. It was Captain Marcel Kerr David who was assigned to bomb the Al Kark Tower. Even though I felt very well prepared with my training, I was somewhat apprehensive about the aircraft, he admitted later. Its stealthiness had not been tested in combat, and everyone wondered whether or not this stealth stuff really worked. Anticipating a pilot-rattling sleet of anti-aircraft flyer, mission planners had assigned a second stealth jet to mark Kerr David's target and lighten his workload. As the laser beam touched the Alcark's dome-shaped roof, a forward-looking infrared radar scope in the nose of Kerr David's plane picked up the signal and displayed it in the cockpit's 8-inch video display. Using a fingertip control on his throttle stick, Kerr David locked his aim plane onto the laser glint, and his weapon system projected an imaginary basket above it, into which it would have to drop the bomb for a successful strike. Ten seconds before release, Kerr David hit the pickle button that enabled his weapon system. The Nighthawk's bomb bay snapped open and lowered its lethal load into the slipstream, a one-ton GBU-27AB guided bomb designed especially for the use by the F-117A. Freed of the necessity of dodging anti-aircraft fire, Kerr David was able to drop his bomb from relatively high above and near the Al Kark. He immediately veered away north toward his secondary target, a command bunker in the Taji suburbs. The second F-117 loitered on station a little longer, using its belly-mounted, downward-looking infrared radar laser designator to mark the target for Kerr David's bomb as it fell. In their room in the Al Rashid Hotel, the CNN reporter's microphones picked up the rising moan of an air raid warning. Now the sirens are sounding for the first time, noted Peter Arnott. The Iraqis have informed us. At that instant, as if out of nowhere, Kerr David's GBU-27 slammed into the El Kark, drilling halfway down in the tower before exploding. The entire building snapped in half, a spectacle lost to CNN viewers and personnel at King Khalid, because the network promptly went black. A surviving audio-only land link allowed Arnott to verbally describe the blinding spray of aimless return fire rising above the Baghdad skyline. The Iraqis' gunners' radars told them no aircraft were above them. Seconds later, another F-117A's GBU-27 hit directly across the Tigris from the Al-Kark. 
It fell through the roof of the 12-story Baghdad International Telephone Exchange, known to the Air Force missions planners as the AT&T Building, and the only target in the city slated for a double hit. One of those planners was the 415th Tactical Fighter Squadron's Major Jerry Leatherman, who 60 seconds after the first strike circled in from the northeast to drop a pair of high-blast Mark 84 homers from three miles up through the hole in a building's roof. The first went a little low, but the second was get on, and together they demolished the top four floors. In quick succession, three waves of stealth jets singled out their objectives with the precision at once merciful and merciless. The Iraqi Air Force and Ba'ath Party Headquarters, Air Defense Control Centers, Rashid Airfield, and other high-value targets, including two of Saddam Hussein's presidential palaces. A half hour after the initial attacks, the city blacked out, probably not because of Iraq to precautions, but because the power grid was destroyed. But Baghdad remained well lit by the AAA fire. Back at King Khalid, the ground crews anxiously counted the returning aircraft, the last of which did not touch down until after dawn. Miraculously, not only did every Nighthawk come back, but none of them bore as so much as a scratch. In the first 24 hours of the war, the 42 stealth fighters at King Khalid, just 2.5% of the total Allied aircraft deployed in the Gulf, accounted for 31% of the targets attacked. Damage estimates were lower than expected, partly due to a lower layer of mist that obscured Baghdad toward dawn. Not only did cloud cover, three times the seasonal average during the course of the war, interfere with subsequent operations, it compromised the black jet's invisibility. If you're just above a cloud deck, with the moon reflecting off it, you can really stick out, explained Leatherman. At one point, an F-117A was shadowed by what appeared to be an Iraqi Dassault Mirage F-1 fighter, shining a landing light or a spotlight in order to visually acquire the stealth jet. A gentle turn, however, broke whatever lock the Iraqi had. That was the closest any Nighthawk came to a dogfight over Iraq. The black jets were consistently assigned to the most dangerous, high-priority targets throughout the Gulf War. These included radar sites, SAM and SCUD launchers, enemy command, control, communication facilities, bridges, hardened aircraft shelters, and bunkers. Their data recorders provided some spectacular video footage of Air Force publicists. These included a hardened Scud storage facility destroyed by a laser-guided bomb dropping through an air duct, one bomb blowing in the door of an ammunition bunker, and a second bomb flying through to explode inside, a GVU-27 flying down an elevator shaft to detonate deep within the Iraqi Air Force headquarters, blowing out all four walls. Ultimately, the greatest purpose served by Nighthawk's surgical strikes, as opposed to indiscriminate bombing, was the saving of lives on both sides. Statistically, during the course of Desert Storm, the 37th TFW compiled a record that is unparalleled in the chronicles of air warfare. The Nighthawks achieved an 80% hit rate on pinpoint targets while destroying nearly 40% of all strategic targets attacked by the coalition forces. The 37th TFW's performance also drew high praise from military and political leaders. In particular, Senator Sam Nunn, Senate Armed Service Committee Chairman, stated the F-117A to be the heart of our offensive power and targeting capability. Brigadier General Buster Glosson, 14th Air Division Commander, called the 37th TFW the backbone of the strategic air campaign. General Colin Powell, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, commented, You are showing the nation what it's all about, the combination of the very highest technology with the very best kind of people we can put together in the field as a team. Secretary of Defense Richard Cheney stated, You have gone far beyond anything anybody envisioned. It has been phenomenal. The 37th Tactical Fighter Wing, redesignated the 49th Tactical Fighter Wing, relocated from Tonopah to Halliforce Air Force Base. Air Force analysts have so far found no way stealth technology can be compromised in the foreseeable future. In any case, the F-117A Nighthawk, the Skunk Works, and Ben Rich are assured their places in aviation history. We guaranteed to deliver an aircraft which would have stealth characteristics, be virtually undetectable by today's known radar technologies, and be able to deliver a weapon system with unprecedented accuracy, said Rich. We've done that. Our accomplishments speak for themselves. My name is Harold Carlson Farley, Jr. 
and I was raised under the name of Carlson. When my wife gets serious, she calls me Carlson, but everybody else calls me Hal. And I got that from the military as being herald to Hal. Skunk Works. Back in uh, 1943, I believe it was, the United States Air Force realized that the Germans were fielding a new jet airplane called the ME-262, a twin-engine jet that was capable of reaching our uh, long-range bombers, the B-17s. So um, they felt that they needed a, a jet airplane. We needed a jet airplane for the Air Force. And so they contacted Lockheed for the job. I'm not sure exactly if, what their motivation was to come to Lockheed, but Kelly Johnson was a pretty well-known airplane designer and had been instrumental in the P-38, which was a, a first frontline fighter in the, in the war. Anyway, they came and they said, we need an airplane in five months, uh, a jet airplane in five months. And uh, Kelly Johnson, uh, who was uh, a well-thought-of young engineer who had a very strong personality and a great amount of leadership capability and, and very strong, very strong man. He, um, he said, I'll take on the job. It has to be done by my rules. He had 14 basic sets of rules. I can't name all 14 of them, but a, two or three of them are, are important. One, he gets to select the very best people he has in the whole company. Number two, uh, he reports directly to the company president. Three, nobody else interferes with the project at all. It's his project, and he's the boss, and the rest of the people in the Skunk Works are workers. So anyway, those are the rules that he set up for taking on that project. And <clears throat> it took the Air Force a month to deliver the proposal, but in the meantime, he'd already started working on the airplane, knowing full well he was going to be doing it. And they managed to deliver the airplane in uh, 143 days. That comes out a bit shorter than five months, four months and some days, which was pretty phenomenal when you think about it. And it was a pretty advanced airplane. Uh, it was the XP-80 and uh, made its first flight in 1943. And the pilot at controls was a fellow by the name of Milo Burcham who was later killed in an accident. That was how the Skunk Works got its start uh, and its reputation of being able to do a job quickly, on time, and under cost. Well, the name uh, Skunk Works uh, was from the Little Abner comic strip where, I uh, can't remember the character, but he was up in the woods and he would uh, brew up this Kickaboo Joy Juice, some white lightning, I guess, and it smelled bad. And uh, there were some odors that were in the hangar area of Burbank there. And so one day, one of the engineers answered the phone and, and said the skunk works, which was spelled S-K-O-N-K. And uh, everybody started calling it skunk works, but the uh, creator of Lil Abner said, no, you can't use that. And he, and went to court over it. I guess we probably conceded. I don't remember if there's any details of that, but uh, we uh, changed from Skunk Works to Skunk Works, and that's stuck, and we've always had the emblem of a skunk on the tail of the airplanes. The year I joined the Skunk Works was 1978, and I joined by uh, because I had been working with a fellow um, Dr. Ken Stewart, um, he had a PhD in plasma physics, and he and I had been working on a new head-up display for the F-14. I was working for Grumman at that time, and uh, Minos to me was also assigned to the head-up display for the new stealth fighter that was being developed at the Skunk Works. I read in the newspaper in the Los Angeles Times a very short paragraph that said a pilot had been injured in the desert his name was Bill Park, William Park, and there was no details in that little thing, that little clip. And I always remember reading that and realizing or thinking that's very unusual. There was, there's something going on up in the desert that, that they're not telling anything about, but they had to say something about the accident. It was my future boss who was in that accident, and he uh, needed a pilot because he had injured himself pretty bad. He had asked some people around, and Ken Stewart recommended me. Uh, he called me one day. He was very abrupt on the telephone. He said, my name is Bill Park. He said, All right, would you be interested in a job at Lockheed? And I said, well, I 
you, you'd have to tell me something about it. Well, he said it's, it's at the Skunk Works. You know, the Skunk Works is a magic word among pilots, and uh, I was immediately interested when he said that. I said, uh, yeah, I, I, w I would be interested if you could tell me something about it. He said, well, I'll call you back. And, uh, and that was the end of that conversation. And for about three weeks, I figured it went away and wasn't coming back. But he did call me back, and he said, uh, have you thought about it? I said, yeah. Uh, I said, I would be interested. And he, he said, all right. He said, I'd like for you to come down for an interview. He said, but I don't want you to come to the company. I want you to come to my house. And so I said, okay. He gave me the address, and it was down in Westwood. And it, the house was on the golf course in, uh, in Westwood, down in the high, high rent district of L.A. And it was a gorgeous home. And I mean, it was, it was a beautiful home. And there was nobody there. His wife wasn't there. She was somewhere else. And he greeted me, and I came in, and, and we had our chat. And when I left, um, I said, man, those guys must pay a lot of money. Turns out that Bill and his wife were really good at real estate. But that was uh, how I got uh, introduced to, to uh, the Skunk Works. It took about three months to, to get a clearance. I had a secret clearance from Grumman, but this was secret special access required, which is a couple of levels above secret uh, to, to be able to access the program. So. I was placed in the uh, penalty box, they called it, until the clearance came through. And then when it came through, they then would could introduce me to what it was we were going to fly. And, and the, I remember uh, Alan Brown was one of the senior engineers, and he took me into a room, and the drawings were up on the, on the wall, regular blue, blueprint drawings. And he said, what do you think of that? And if you, as you know, it's a very unusual looking airplane and it's very highly swept angles. And uh, my first thought was the darn thing must be a reentry vehicle. It had to be something like that. And uh, then he explained it to me what it was for, that it was to evade radar. And I really didn't pick up on how important that was at the time. I, I thought that was okay, good to evade radar. How well does it fly? Is it a real fighter? Can we? shoot things down with it, you know, and what a pilot wants to do is uh, be able to maneuver his airplane well. And, and it turns out the airplane is pretty, you know, uh, low performance, relatively speaking, to the current day fighters. And so um, that's uh, how I was introduced to the airplane. And then I was assigned to the weapon system to work on the displays with my old friend Ken from Grumman, who was working down there at Lockheed and at Grumman at the same time. Well, the first prototype was on the floor. Uh, what was available was the wooden mock-up. They had a complete wooden mock-up, full-scale wooden mock-up they were using to, to do the wire runs in. This is really crude, you know, manufacturing process quite a few years ago, but they were using this wooden mock-up to, to place displays in the cockpit, to, to locate uh, boxes and, uh, you know, see if they would fit. And, and We also had offices right alongside that, and we had people that were working on the displays, and, and, and I was assigned to the, to the cockpit and, uh, displays, and we had two other pilots that were uh, working on other aspects of the airplane as well with the engineers. I think it was for two reasons. One, I had been a, a test pilot in industry for a number of years. The other fellows had come directly from the military. It isn't that you can fly any better. It's just that how do you deal with engineering and, and, and the company? Uh, and I was, I think, better prepared to do that than the uh, Air Force guys that were and, and another Navy guy that came in. I think that was one of the reasons, and uh, the other reason is I worked like the devil. I worked hard because I wanted to be the project pilot on it, and uh, I was selected. At, uh, that's what I think was the reason. In order to be able to be the project pilot and the first flight pilot, on the competition for that is, is intense. You want to be the guy that gets the job, and, uh, 
and you work hard. That's that's that uh, you work with engineering. You work with uh, and you and you're flying. We are flying at the time. We were flying airplanes like T-38s, and uh, so you're being evaluated by the boss and and also the customer. It is something that uh, uh, I don't know how to describe it any other way. It's, it's an intense process. The the um, uh, secrecy, the classification of the program was at the same level as the uh, Manhattan Project. That was how how secret it was, and it was very successful. If you recall, we spent many years working and actually having the airplane in operational readiness, and not many people knew anything about it. And uh, so it was uh, highly classified, remotely developed, uh, a lot of time away from family. Uh, we spent usually six day weeks uh, and we would leave home and come back after Friday or Saturday night and then turn around and go back out Monday morning for well I guess probably the first year and a half was that we were separated that much. My wife knew I was flying I mean that was my job but that was all I could tell her. I couldn't tell her what I was flying, where we were. We had a special arrangement uh, secure telephones so we could call home through the office uh, fairly regularly uh, and and not have to worry, uh, you know, just to check in and see how everything's going as as, as the hot water heater broken down or whatever. But uh, yeah, it was it was pretty strenuous on the family life. People that I associated with knew that know know about the skunk works. They know you're going to say I can't tell you. There, there's nothing I can I can tell you about it. I can tell you, I can say this: the Air Force were flying A7s as a cover airplane. They had a, a squadron of them at Nellis Air Force Base, which were supposedly working on some advanced system, and they were they were kind of secret. But that's where the Air Force was. Uh, they used the A7 as their cover story. Uh, our cover story was just simply we just didn't talk about it. The security that was established within the Skunk Works, the uh, security or the uh, classification uh, culture of the Skunk Works was developed by Kelly Johnson again. And, and back to the, um, a little bit about that initial airplane that he built, the XB-80 that started the Skunk Works, one of the requirements was it had to be t top secret. And one of the reasons for that is it keeps other people out. That was one of the tools to keep other people from becoming involved with the program from becoming a bureaucracy. So the Skunk Works security is, was established um, out of common sense. For example, if you put a guard out in front of a, a place, somebody's gonna know something's inside. They didn't put any guards out. If you put um, secret or confidential on a, on a drawing uh, of an airplane, uh, you're going to know it's a secret. Something's going on if somebody gets a hold of it. They didn't. They didn't. They didn't uh, stamp any of the things classified at all. They didn't have any guards outside. They made it as as uh, normal as possible, so as to not attract attention. Um, they went so far way back uh, um, when the satellites were first coming out and. Uh, uh, they took all the names off of the uh, parking places because they could find out who was working there. The, the enemy could find out who was working there, the enemy being the Cold War and Russia. The Skunk Works operated out of Burbank and has operated out of Burbank all the way back to the P-38, to the U-2, to the SR-71, to F-117. All of them have been built there and, um, and down in beautiful downtown Burbank inside a big old World War II hangar. The airplanes were uh, assembled there, then they were the wings were taken off of them, and in the case of the F-117, they flew a C-5, which is the Air Force's huge cargo airplane. They'd, they'd fly it in in the middle of the night, and they would take the phone calls for the noise abatement, because there's always somebody in the neighborhood who didn't like the noise, but it only happened every now and then, so we kind of disregarded it. But anyway, they would uh, make a, a box frame out of wood, two by fours, and drape a tarp over it so it would not show any part of the shape of the airplane whatsoever. And they put it on wheels and they would wheel it out, put it in the C5, and then they would fly it off to where we would test the airplane. 
and uh, was reassembled and then tested at, at a remote location. And that was done, uh, in fact, back in the SR-71 days, uh, they didn't have a C-5A to transport that around, so they developed a false front, if you will, for a truck line. Lockheed had a trucking company that was named some weird name, and it was on the back of those trucks that they hauled the, the SR-71 fuselage and wings to the, to the test location. The first flight was a success, I'll say that, because we took off and we landed. But uh, there were some uh, problems that we encountered and some, some things we discovered that needed to be fixed. Um, but let me go back just a little bit. The airplane is unstable in pitch and yaw. It can't be flown without the assistance of computers. At the lower speeds, it's about neutrally stable, which is almost flyable. One of the bits of information that goes to the computers to help fly that airplane is the air data that goes in the probes on the front of the airplane. And the engineers were afraid that the vibration of those probes on takeoff and in turbulent air might send vibrations to the flight controls and cause them to oscillate. And so therefore they did not want to use the air data on the initial takeoff. So what we did was we put a bunch of lead in the front of the airplane and made it positively stable, thinking that I could manage the airplane. Uh, it was still not real stable, but it was stable enough that we felt that I could fly the airplane satisfactorily up to 10,000 feet and then turn on the air data information to the computers so that if it did cause a problem, there would be plenty of room between me and the ground to get those things turned off again and bring the airplane back. That was the plan, and that's what we did. We took off ballasted with lead in the nose so that it was um, slightly stable on takeoff, which was fine. The rotation and everything was good in pitch. It was that the fact that the airplane started to yaw and it went out, I, I believe it was six degrees to the left. And then I tried the rudder to, to stop it and it didn't respond right away. And then it slowly came back the other way and went out to around 12 or 13 degrees the other way. And that's very uncomfortable in an airplane to feel like you're skidding sideways. And uh, so I realized that th this, th this thing wasn't acting the way we expected to act based on the wind tunnel and simulation that we'd done. Actually, I had uh, three switches for pitch, roll, and yaw over on the left-hand console, and the yaw switch I had had extended because that was the most critical one. And I turned on the air data so that it would come to the, through the probes and go to the flight control computer to help me fly the airplane. And it did. It worked fine. There was no, there were no vibrations or anything like that. But they got turned on a lot quicker than we planned to do because we were going to go to 10,000 feet to turn them on. Based on that information, we realized that the fins on the airplane, the tail fins on the airplane, were uh, considerably too small. The wind tunnel data, I don't know how it was. A mistake was made somehow. Uh, I believe I heard that it, they didn't take into full account the sting that the uh, the pole that you put an airplane in a wind tunnel on contributes to stability. And I'm not sure that's the case. At any rate, they came up with a figure that they, they said we were going to be more stable than we really were. So the fins were too small. And that was the big discovery on the, on the first flight. And we flew the airplane six more times uh, in a very limited flight envelope while they were building a new set of fins 50% bigger that were put on the airplane. And from that point on, we had the proper amount of stability. Uh, those were, that was the big thing learned on the airplane. The, the minor problems that we occurred I, are not minor, really. We had overheat in the tailpipes because the tailpipes were rectangular and in the corners, heat builds up. And uh, they, reached, they, they were reaching limited temperatures. And we also had the canopy unlock light that came on and that was uh, of concern because if the canopy had come off, uh, you get a face full of, of wind and uh, it was marginal about whether you could land the airplane or not. Uh, and the other thing was that we heard a big thump and that was the blow indoors, which were spring loaded and activated so that it gave enough air for the airplane on the ground enough air to the engines to run properly and then as you accelerated more air came in the inlets and then the, the doors would spring load shut making the airplane stealthy because you can't have openings in the airplane and be stealthy and when they slammed shut there was two very pronounced thumps that I hadn't anticipated scared the heck out of me and but 
there was no indication in the control station nor on my instruments, so we continued on with the flight. The flight was only 15 minutes, limited by the uh, temperature in the tailpipe. And that was, that was basically the first flight, yeah. No, I've never had a UFO sighting. <laughs> okay, that's good. How we worked together at the Skunk Works and with our customer was absolutely critical to the success of that, of that airplane. Uh, the airplane was a huge success. The program was a huge success. In the world of flight test, in the last 30, 40, 50 years, there's always been a aura of competition between the company pilots and the customer pilots, the Air Force pilot or the Navy pilot that's gonna be getting the airplane. Ever since I started the testing business, I was a Navy test pilot for a long time, and then I became a civilian test pilot for Grumman flying F-14s uh, and A-6s, and uh, it was always a us and them battle, you know. Uh, we felt like we could do it better as company pilots than they could. It was, it, it was just kind of, I, I know, testosterone, ego, whatever you want to call it, it was always a, a, a scrap. and. And it, I learned from this experience that cooperation works a whole lot better than ad adversarial relationships. Kelly Johnson's, one of his basic rules was, we need to be allowed to test our product, otherwise we will never be able to you know, advance our products in the future. So he felt like he needed a corporate knowledge in the, in the form of pilot experience in the airplanes uh, uh, that he built. And the Air Force has always felt that they wanted to do all the flying. Um, it's always been a compromise. If you have a combined test force, typically the company does fly the first flight of the airplane and does flutter and does structural and does all that stuff, but the operational aspects are done by the customer, which I think is a good way to do it. But there's always a little bit of a conflict. But we had a very unique individual in the Air Force, a guy by the name of Skip Anderson who was running the Air Force side of the test force. He had a very unique way of calming us company pilots down. He, he, he provided great leadership, and he worked well with Ben Rich, the head of the uh, Skunk Works, and they got along great, and we saw that, and we all followed suit. And I give Skip a lot of credit for that. Uh, we got along very well. John Beasley was one of the Air Force guys, and uh, he was just one of the team. We were all teammates. One of the criteria for working at our remote location is you had to get along. If anybody didn't get along, you were out of there. So teamwork and cooperation were fundamental to the success of the, of the program. What does it take to make a good test pilot? I think one of the things is you the basic flying skills need to be above average. I think that responsibility to the company and to the product are fundamental to being a good test pilot. I think involvement with the design and development of the airplane is critical to being a good test pilot. I think an engineering degree or uh, advanced degree is, in this, this day and age, the kids that go off to the test pilot schools, they, they arrive there with master's degrees, and a lot of them go out way with PhDs, you know. They're, they're way above me. I only had a bachelor's degree. But uh, it's hard for me to say I'm, I'm telling you about what I think I am, you know. Am I an above average pilot? Yeah, I am. I, I can say that honestly. Am I one of those great stick and rudder guys like Bob Hoover, who was a phenomenal pilot, is a phenomenal pilot? I'm not one of those. But do I get involved with the project? I do. I get very involved with the project, or did when I was working. Well, first of all, if I were talking to my grandson, who they're all grown up, my great-grandsons, I would say first thing is honesty. Be totally honest. If you can't be honest, then you're going to tell somebody something that you did that you didn't do. And I learned that really early in test piloting game. 
several people had made a mistake. It was a simple mistake. They left a switch in the wrong place. And if you took off an afterburner, you were dumping fuel and it would light up and you'd leave this big long torch behind the airplane. And I did that. And I came back and I convinced myself that that switch was in the right place and that I didn't switch it, but I did. And so I, I was embarrassed by that. I got caught with my hand in a cookie jar and that was my real lesson in, in honesty. I, you have to be honest as a test pilot. You can't, you know, if you made a mistake, man, you gotta tell them because otherwise they might blame it on the airplane or they might, you know, the manufacturing process may be changed or the engineering process. I learned, as I mentioned in the last uh, bit of discussion, that to work with people, you have to respect them, you have to respect their ideas, and you have to present yourself as their co-equal. Honesty, integrity, care for other people. In the world of test piloting, once a guy gets to be the chief test pilot, it is normal for the chief test pilot to to go out and fly all the good stuff. And that was the way it was at Grumman. Uh, there was a man by the name of Corky Meyer for years was the chief test pilot. And anytime a goodie came up, a first flight or a bonus flight, you know, we got extra pay if it was hazardous. The lead guy, the chief pilot, would end up going out and doing it. And there was a fellow there that worked at, at uh, Grumman, and I won't mention his name, became the chief pilot, and he did everything. And the rest of us were doing the dog work. And I said, you know, if I ever get to be chief pilot, I'm gonna share the load a little bit. And uh, and those guys, I got to be the first flight pilot. There's two other guys that got, were very lucky that I got to be the first flight pilot in the F-117. Because I said, if I got to be chief pilot, as I said, I, I, would, just, I would share. And uh, so I had two guys working for me that were, we were very close, Dave Ferguson and Tom Morganfeld. Dave was an Air Force guy, Tom was uh, a Navy guy. When it came time for the F-22 to come along, I had plans. I was dreaming about sailing around the world, and I thought, and I was getting to be, you know, closer to 55. And so I, I said, I'm going to do what I said I was going to do, and I gave Dave Ferguson the project pilot job. I was the chief pilot and director of flight ops, but he was the project pilot and would be flying the first flight on the F-22. The day he went out and flew that first flight, I was out there watching it, and I was saying, man, I wish I had made and made that promise, but <laughs> I was very envious of the day he got to fly. I would have been able to fly the airplane if I had just exercised my rights as the chief pilot. And then the, the next airplane, the F-35 that came along, Tom Morgenfeldt got to fly the first flight. So uh, each one of us got a first flight, and I'm kind of proud of that. We had T-38 Talons. Uh, we had A-7s. We had F-4s all of which we could fly anytime we wanted to. And that was just a, that was like the astronauts had, you know, they had, their airplanes were out there, anytime you wanted to go fly, you, you can go fly. And it was good, it maintained proficiency. It wasn't just a good deal. And we did a lot of air-to-air -air stuff, and we'd go out and fight each other. That was very good for confidence and very good for uh, proficiency. The F-14 flies like a small airplane. It's a big airplane, but it flies well, flies, flies small. I enjoyed the A4. The A4 is a, a little sports car. You know, it's got uh, 270 degree per second roll rate. Put the stick over and you're through two 360 degree rolls about that quick. Uh, and of course the F-117, which turns out to be, we, we tailored the flight control system so well that it's very easy to fly. I mean, it feels just like a, a normal airplane and one of the best normal of the normal airplanes. Like an F-15 is very easy to fly. Uh, very easy to land, very easy to take off, and it, uh, excellent flying qualities. Uh, the reason that the uh, F-117 was retired was because of the F-22. Uh, the F-22 is, is a high performance airplane. It can do what the F-117 can do. It carries its weapons internally. Uh, it can deliver air to ground. It can deliver air to air. It can go supersonic. Uh, it can cruise supersonic. And it's, uh, it's aerodynamically shaped. And you notice it has curved surfaces, and the F-117 has flat surfaces. And the reason was, when we des designed and built the F-117, the original program was not nearly as sophisticated as the programs they are using now to predict and develop stealth shapes. 
And so we had to go with flat surfaces, flat and angles. So that's where they they differ. That's just in the money required. And then there's rumor around. It was mentioned the other day by a friend of mine uh, talking about Aviation Week had an article that they've seen an F-117 flying. And that would really make me feel good. Aviation, the art of aeronautics, began with the dreamers, inventors, and daredevils who dared to defy gravity. The journey of aviation was nurtured by pioneers like the Wright brothers, whose first flight marked a historic milestone. The role of aircrafts in world wars was groundbreaking, dramatically changing warfare strategies. This initiated a technological evolution in aviation, transforming the simplistic wings of a biplane into the thunderous roar of jet engines. Let's journey through the ages of aviation. Behind every great aircraft, there were great minds. These visionaries, like Sir Frank Whittle, the innovator of the turbojet engine, redefined air travel. Then there's Skunk Works' Kelly Johnson, the genius behind the SR-71 Blackbird. His designs combined speed, stealth and power, crafting machines that dominated the heavens. The contributions of these pioneers have left an indelible mark on the canvas of aviation, shaping the course of history and inspiring generations of engineers and aviators. Each epoch in aviation history gave birth to extraordinary aircrafts, each with their own unique features and roles. The Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird was a marvel of speed and stealth. The F-105 Thunderchief, a supersonic fighter bomber, was vital in the Vietnam War. The P-51 Mustang, a long-range fighter, was critical in World War II. The P-47 Thunderbolt, a heavyweight fighter, was used extensively in the same war. The A-10 Thunderbolt II, the Warthog, is a close air support icon. The Messerschmitt ME-262 marked a leap forward in aviation technology. Each of these game changers were instrumental in their eras, and their legacies still resonate today. Beyond the game changers, there are those that have transcended their practical roles to become icons. The Concorde was not just an aircraft, it was a supersonic symbol of luxury and speed. The B-52 Stratofortress, a strategic bomber, is an icon of power and resilience. These magnificent machines and others like them have become much more than just aircrafts. They are enduring icons that encapsulate the audacious spirit, the relentless innovation, and the boundless ambition that define the world of aviation. For more amazing aerial footage, and to join us in this incredible journey, check out the Dronescapes YouTube channel. If you enjoyed this video, please remember to like and subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.